Hello. It's good to see you today. I wanted to share this book with you. I bought this at a library book sale not too long ago. This book is a hundred years old. It's part of a set. It's in great shape. This book is from 1922. Copyright 1922. And it's called, it's a, a volume of a set. And the title is Wonders. And I'm so glad I found this. They only had one other book from the set and it was just like one of the, and it, they were in alphabetical order. Or, you know, the, they were divided up that way. They're, it's like encyclopedias. This one is titled Wonders. And I lost track of time earlier just looking through this book. It's fascinating. It's the standard reference work for the home, school, and library. The Book of Wonders. Minneapolis and Chicago Standard Education Society, 1922. Well, okay, the copyright date is 1921. 101 years. This book has all kinds of information on just so many different topics. It starts out with the story behind your watch, and it has several different sub subtopics and subheadings. This first section about telling time is really interesting, like who invented the watch, discovery of the mainspring, the first minute hands. It says the first watches only had one hand. And then they show you a modern watch movement. There are so many interesting pictures, illustrations in here. How Geneva became a watchmaking center. It's just fascinating. And I thought it would be a lot of fun to pick a section and just read you some, some of this stuff in here. How a watch looks when taken apart. And then they'll have these little sections after longer segments where they answer various questions that are somehow related. Like, how did the months originate? How did the months get their names? How did hours, minutes, and seconds originate? Why do some months have 31 days? It's just fascinating. We have all kinds of things, how man learned to count. And so we have early mechanical methods of accounting. The cipher, zero, revolutionized counting. It's just really interesting. Oh, there's a whole section here on saws, where the saw came from, how saws originated. We have a flint saw. Look at that. Japanese saw. You're at work. The knife blade. What happens when a saw cuts? It shows you how a saw cuts. Saws that cut without teeth. How saws are made. We have information about wireless telephones. A pilot and observer using Western Electric intercommunicating set to talk with each other while in the air. Memory, the basis of all imagination. So we have little subsections about memory. What is memory? Special memory locations in our brain. What does memory do for us? Do Animals have memory. Oh, and here's a section on buttons. How buttons are secured from shells. Why women button from left to right. And then how man learned to weigh things. The law of the lever. Cards. Playing cards. More information about cards. Look at that booty. 
I'm jealous. <laughs> the almanac and playing cards. The story in a hat. I really want to read about hats. I want to read all of this to you. It's so fascinating. I was just sitting here just reading. I lost all track of time. I read about hats. I read about watches. I read about trains. They have a lot of information about hats. The first railroad. The first passenger car. Here we have five carloads of freight. Passenger trains. Making many locomotives at one time. The exterior view of the first Pullman car. And there's the interior. Oh, they have a whole section on cork. This section is the story in a cork. It tells you all about corks, where corks come from, how they're, how they're, you know, crafted and the different uses for it, weighing and boiling the rough cork. Five million corks a day from this factory. What is done with cork waste? Things made from cork. See, I love stuff like this. If you follow my vlog channel, you've probably heard me say that I love to learn something new every day. And this book is just chock full of just the coolest information. It's just so neat. I love it. How man learned to fight fire. They have a whole bunch of information about firefighting and the history of firefighting and making fireproof uh, structures and fireproof file cabinets. Finishing processes and making metal furniture. But yeah, I love to learn new things. My grandmother, her last words of advice to me before she passed away at 94 was, Never stop reading, never stop learning. She said, that is the true fountain of youth. It's not looks, it's not any of that stuff. It's information. It's about growing and expanding your mind. That is what keeps you young. Keep learning, don't ever stop learning. She told me, she said, you are never too old to learn new things. And she loved to read, and she, she would have loved this book. This book came out when she was 12 years old. She was born in 1910. And she passed away at 94. And read many, many books in her time. But she told me that, and I passed that, that advice on to you. Never stop reading. Never, ever stop learning new things. You are never, never too old to stop, to stop learning. So I have always enjoyed learning new things. Here is the history of the fork. Look at the evolution of the fork. <laughs> That's pretty cool. They also have information about spoons and knives. Steps in making a silver knife. The origin of spoons. How were they made? The story behind a charge of explosives. Interesting effects of explosives. Uses, other uses of explosives in war. So this book came out not long after World War I. This, there's a lot of information in this book, but today we'll go ahead and get to the part that we're going to read today. I decided we were going to read the story behind the typewriter. And up here is a picture of the first typist, original model of the inventor Christopher Latham Scholes, operated by his daughter Lillian Scholes. Look, at, this is the first practical writing machine, Model 1 from Remington, 
1874. So I marked this page because this is where I wanted us to stop and read. Okay. How the typewriter was thought of. During the winter of 1866-67, to 67, C. Latham Shoals, a printer and editor, and Samuel W. Soule, also a printer, inventor, and farmer, were engaged together in developing a machine for serially numbering the pages of blank books. At the same shop in which they were having the artisan work done, Mr. Carlos Glidden was also engaged in developing a mechanical spader to be used instead of a plow. Glidden became much interested in the Shoals machine and one day chanced to remark to him, why cannot a machine be made that will write letters and words instead of figures only? I do want to remind you this book is 100 years old and it will not read like stuff written today. So I, I, I rather like the way it flows. I love to read older books like this. I think it, I think it does a lot more for your for your mind instead of cutting everything up in little bits. I love the way they word things. Thus was the seed of thought dropped without any knowledge at the time of speaking that such an idea had ever before been suggested. Nothing further was said or done at that time, but the sequel showed that the suggestion was not an idle one and was destined to bear abundant fruit in due season. In the spring of the following year, 1867, a copy of the Scientific American, which quoted an article from a London technical journal, fell into the hands of Mr. Glidden. It described a machine called the Teratype, winged type, invented by one John Pratt of Center, Alabama, which was designed to do just what Mr. Glidden had suggested. An editorial article in the paper pointed out the great benefit to man which such a machine would confer, as well as the fortune which the successful inventor would acquire. This was brought to the attention of Mr. Shoals and strongly appealed to his imagination. He was a man of intellectual temperament, though perhaps somewhat lacking in the more severe practical qualities necessary to carry out an enterprise such as he was about to inaugurate. He determined to see what could be done, and as Glidden had first suggested the idea, he invited him to join in the enterprise. Sol was subsequently invited to join. Glidden was of a mechanical turn and suggested many devices, but the ideas of the others seemed to be of a more practical nature. So that it finally turned out that Glidden's principal share in the invention was in the value of the general suggestions which he made. The first crude model constructed was largely the work of Soul, who suggested the pivoted types set in a circle and other minor details. Scholes contributed the letter spacing device. The work went steadily onward, and by September of that year, the first machine had been made. It was a success in so far as it was able to write accurately and with fair rapidity, but it soon proved to be far from a practical writing machine. Many letters were written with it and sent to friends. One of these was sent to Mr. James Densmore. This proved fortunate for the developing enterprise, for it brought into a man it brought into it a man of practical affairs who had sufficient enthusiasm to purchase an interest in the enterprise without having so much as seen the machine. Mr. Dinsmore had been both editor and printer and recognized the value of such a machine. Mr. Dinsmore did not actually see the typewriter until March 1868. 
He then pronounced it good for nothing save to show the feasibility of the idea and urged further improvement, pointing out many defects which would need to be remedied before the instrument could be made available for practical uses. At this time, Sowell dropped out of the enterprise, leaving it entirely to Scholes, Glidden, and Dinsmore. Scholes continued to devise model after model until some 25 or 30 experimental machines had been made, each a little better than its predecessor, although still lacking some of the essentials of a successful machine. In the hands of practical users, each of these was proved to be good in some respects, but broke down under the strain of constant usage. Scholz's patience at this point was nearly exhausted, but shrewdness and common sense of Dinsmore proved the salvation of the enterprise, for he insisted that criticisms and tests were just what were needed to reveal the weak points. He insisted that the enterprise be abandoned until a machine was constructed that anyone could use. By slow degrees, the original conceptions of the inventor were modified by practical experience until in 1873 it was deemed sufficiently perfect to be placed in the hands of a manufacturer with a view to putting the typewriter on the market for general use and with this end in view, Dinsmore offered it to the, to the great gun factory of E. Remington and Sons at Illion, New York. With the assistance of an acquaintance, Mr. G. W. N. Yost, they were successful in their endeavor, and the Remington firm agreed to undertake the manufacture of the new machine. And this is the first typewriter which wrote both capitals and small letters, the Model to Remington from 1878. Notwithstanding the, pa the patient thought and money already expended upon it, it proved to be far from a perfect machine. The ample resources and skillful workmen available at the great Remington factory were brought into service in the improvement of the typewriter, which became known as the Remington Typewriter. The first machines were ready for the market in 1874. As sold for general use, they were very different in appearance from the compact and efficient machines in use today. And this was 100 years ago. Although the fundamental principles were the same, Imagine what they would think about what we do now. They would, they would love it. The sale was slow and the results disappointing due to the public being skeptical about the value of the new machine for practical purposes. The one great objection to its use being the fact that it wrote capital letters only. This difficulty was at last overcome by the invention of the Model 2 Remington, the first shift-key typewriter which appeared on the market in 1878. The feature of this machine, which is common to nearly all present-day typewriters, is the mounting of two types on each bar. The transition from small letters to capitals being made by means of the shift-key. This proved to be a long step in advance, and the typewriter began to gain in popular favor. The next notable advance in typewriter construction was the automatic ribbon reverse, which made its first appearance in 1896. Prior to this important invention, it had always been necessary for the typist to rewind the ribbon when she came to the end of the spool. On the present-day machines, the ribbon action is automatic and requires no attention from the typist. An even more important advance occurred two years later when the first tabulating typewriter was brought out. 
Prior to this invention, the uses of the writing machine had practically been confined to the straight line-by-line -line writing. The invention of the decimal tabulator made it possible to write figures in columns, units under units, tens under tens, etc. with the full measure of typewriter speed, the tops on the decimal tabulator always bringing the typewriter carriage instantly to the correct writing point of any column or as many columns as a page would hold. And this is a picture of the accounting machine equipped for ledger printing, the Remington Standard. The result of this invention was an enormous expansion in the field of the writing machine as it now began to invade the field of tabulator and form writing, which included billing, statement writing, and various accounting and statistical tasks. The next important advance in typewriter construction was the logical result of the invention of the tabulating typewriter and the demand created by this invention. When the machine began to write figures in columns with the same speed as straight line-by-line -line writing, it created a demand for a machine which would not only write these columns, but add them as written. The result of this demand was the first adding and subtracting typewriter, which was brought out in 1907. This great time-saving feature, the great time-saving feature of this machine is that it eliminates absolutely the time formerly consumed in adding and checking. It accomplishes this result by making the writing and adding or subtracting a simultaneous operation. In other words, the operator simply writes and the computations are a byproduct of the writing. In our own day, the adding and subtracting typewriter has evolved into the complete accounting machine, which is almost universal in its scope and capacity. It will add as many columns on the page at any desired positions on the page that the work requires. It will also cross-foot the totals of any number of vertical columns, giving the grand total of all added columns. This machine operates in any combination desired by the user, where some vertical columns are added and others subtracted. The accumulating totalizer shows the final net total. The machine will add in the vertical totalizer while it subtracts in the accumulating totalizer, or vice versa. Individual columns may be added vertically and not cross-footed, or cross-footed and not added vertically, according to requirements. The adding of individual columns can be made under any desired system, including plain numerals, any system of money, weights, or measures, and any desired fractions. Needless to say, a machine of such universal range makes it certain that the use of the typewriter for all bookkeeping and accounting tasks may soon become as universal as its use for plain letter writing. Two other recent and notable improvements of the writing machine should also be noted, namely, the first key set tabulating typewriter which was brought out in 1911 in the first self-starting typewriter, which was placed on the market in 1915. The outstanding feature of the key set tabulating typewriter is that it permits of an instant change of setting of the decimal tabulating typewriter. The practical advantage is that it makes the same machine available for use in writing a wide variety of statistical forms with no loss of time in changing from one form to another. The self-starting typewriter, which is a straight correspondence machine, derives its name from the automatic indenting or self-starting mechanism. 
This machine is a great time saver in letter writing because it permits the operator to reach the starting point of the indented lines such as the date, address, paragraphs, yours truly, etc. by a single touch on the special keys thus eliminating all hand settings of the carriage. Each of these successive, successive advances in mechanical efficiency of the typewriter led to a corresponding widening of its field until the use of the typewriter in our day has become as universal as business itself. The typewriter has been the greatest factor in modern times in the economic emancipation of women. Before the invention of the writing machine, women were practically unknown in the offices of the business world. Women entered this field through the door opened to them by the typewriter, and the millions of women so employed today, whether as typists or in other capacities, are all the direct beneficiaries of the inventor of the writing machine. Courtesy of Remington Typewriter Company, New York. The next section has a, uh, this is an article on the earliest mention of asphalt, a road built of natural asphalt. The story in a lake of asphalt. Who discovered asphalt? The story of asphalt goes back to the very beginning of things. It is referred to in the book of Genesis. Noah, in building the ark, was commanded to pitch it within and without with pitch. The pitch referred to was merely not natural asphalt. The earliest people used it. The Egyptians employed it for embalming purposes, and centuries later, asphalt was extracted from mummy wrappings and used in the fine arts as a paint. It was called bitumen. In modern nomenclature, natural bitumen may be a solid, a gas, or a liquid. Asphalt is one of the forms of solid bitumen. Water white gasoline and marsh gas are bitumen, so is solid black asphalt. When we speak of asphalt in this day, the mind at once reverts to street paving. That form of street paving known as sheet asphalt has been used by every large city in the world. The most notable thoroughfares in the world are paved with asphalt, but it has many other uses. Why are there two kinds of asphalt? Broadly speaking, there are two kinds of asphalt, natural and artificial. In defining the words natural and artificial, the dictionaries cite asphalt as an illustration. Artificial asphalt is of comparatively recent origin. It is a byproduct of the great oil refineries. After the lighter constituents of the petroleum, such as gasoline, etc., have been separated and removed, the black, pitch-like remainder is sold as asphalt. How it differs from the natural or true asphalt will be explained later. This is a close-up view of bubbles of Trinidad Asphalt Lake. The lake is always in motion. Along its edges are shrubs and trees called islands, which move from place to place with the movement of the pitch. Pieces of wood which emerge erect at the center of the lake are gradually carried to the circumference. Natural asphalt, as implied by the name, is the product of nature's laboratory and a most curious one. While natural asphalt is found in various parts of the world, there are two great deposits of such paramount importance to our, nat our industrial and commercial needs that it is needless to describe those of lesser consequence. Both these great deposits are found in the same locality. The most important is on the island of Trinidad, British West Indies, a romantic spot of which Port of Spain is the capital. Curious as the island of Trinidad is, 
It contains nothing more interesting than its great deposit of natural asphalt. Nature has stored the asphalt in a great depression that really suggests the laboratory, for it is bowl-like in form, a monstrous mortar shaped like the small receptacles used by the druggist. The deposit is called a lake. The asphalt lake is on the north shore of a peninsula extending southwest from the island. Its area is 114 acres. Borings carried to a depth of 175 feet disclose the fact that the asphalt throughout is of the same character. In the opinion of some scientists, its millions of tons of solid bitumen rest in the crater of what at one time was a large mud spring. And one theory is that asphaltic petroleum, asphalt in liquid form, welled up from below, finally filling the depression or crater where it solidified through the ages. The word solidifies, however, may convey a wrong impression. The asphalt is neither hard nor soft. In this respect alone, it is one of nature's wonders. Think of a substance of such nicely balanced consistency that it will sustain a, a narrow gauge railway and the native workmen and can be dug with a pick, but which will in time settle of its own weight into the form of any receptacle in which it is placed. If a little harder, it would be more, co it would be more costly and difficult to dig. If a little softer, cars and men would sink into its depth. The depressions or excavations made in digging the asphalt soon fill up, or rather settle. Go on the following day to where the natives have been digging and evidence of their work has almost disappeared. Thus, the nature fitted her asphalt to the needs of modern civilization. Neither Columbus nor Raleigh nor the treasure-hunting pirates realized that in this huge depression nature had stored that which men of later generations would transport in ships for thousands of miles, converting it through commerce and industry into gold. Another curious thing about the Trinidad Asphalt Lake is that it is always in motion. Along its edges are shrubs and trees called islands, which move from place to place with the movement of the pitch. Pieces of wood which emerge erect at the center of the lake gradually are carried to the circumference, their deflection from the perpendicular increasing as the distance from the center increases. They finally topple over and are again submerged. The deposit is described as an emulsion of water, gas, bitumen, and, liter and mineral matter, the latter consisting largely of fine sand and a lesser amount of clay. And this picture is a workman digging asphalt on Trinidad Lake. The asphalt is neither hard nor soft. It is necessary to dig it out with a pick and yet it is so soft that the place where digging is done today disappears overnight. How is asphalt dug? Barefoot natives dig the asphalt with mattocks, the only tool necessary. It is like digging into black Swiss cheese, the gas having made perforations similar to those found in Swiss cheese. The men pry out lumps two or three feet long, Fellow workmen who do the carrying lift these heavy burdens to their heads and deposit them in cars nearby. Frequently, they are so heavy that a man requires assistance in lifting them to his head, but once there, he will carry them without difficulty. As previously stated, the lake bears a narrow gauge railroad, the ties being unusually long to prevent settling. The track is shifted from place to place as required. The car bodies consist of large detachable metal buckets resembling hoppers. When dumped into these receptacles, the asphalt again settles into a mass 
and these large units which have assumed the size and shape of a bucket once more become a mass within the hold of the ship from which the asphalt upon arriving at its destination must again be dug as upon the surface of the lake another asphalt lake across the gulf of peria in the northeast part of venezuela another 30 miles from the coast lies another great asphalt deposit known as the Berm bermudez lake its area is more than 900 acres but its maximum depth is only nine feet, the average being about four feet. Surface water is greatly in excess of that on Trinidad Lake, making excavation more difficult. The deposit also differs in character. It has been described as an overflow of soft pitch from several springs, which has spread over the large expanse of soil. The asphalt from this deposit has been used in such large quantities for highway construction that it is known as the Bermudez Good Roads Lake. Compared to the processes in many industries, the various steps from the mining of the asphalt to its use for sundry purposes are very simple. Broadly speaking, there is but one intermediate process, that of refining. Some of the asphalt, especially that destined for foreign ports, is refined at Trinidad, but by far the larger amount is refined at the Great Asphalt Works at Marr, New Jersey. It is placed in large rectangular tanks of 100 tons capacity each. These are provided with pipes carrying steam at a pressure of 125 pounds, and about 325 degrees Fahrenheit. This removes the water and melts the pitch. Live steam passing through the asphalt agitates it while it is heating. The metal asphalt is drawn off from the bottom of the tanks into barrels placed on flat cars. This is the refined asphalt of commerce. And this is a picture of a railroad on the surface of the asphalt lake. And these are metal buckets in which asphalt is transported. A question frequently asked is why ships are sent 2,000 miles to the south and within 700 miles of the equator to bring back a product made by all the great oil refineries. It is due to the fact that nature is the manufacturer in the case of the lake asphalt and has put into it a stability not found in the manufactured product. This has been done through centuries. No man knows how many of seasoning under tropic suns, winds, and rain. To illustrate, the natural or lake asphalt does not lose its ductility when heated and incorporated with sand and stone. Ductility in asphalt is as essential as in the case of metal when the latter is drawn out in the form of wire. Lacking this important property, it would become brittle and break or crumble. Thus, nature's seasoning is of the highest economic value when asphalt is used for paving. It ensures long life in the material when used in the form of sheet asphalt paving and means a tenacious and enduring grip upon the stone when used as a binder in asphalt pavements and roads, reducing maintenance to a minimum. Sheet paving of natural asphalt on heavy traffic city streets has endured for more than a quarter of a century. The Great Thames Embarkment, London, Avenue de Paris in Paris, and Riverside Drive, New York, are paved with natural asphalt. Besides the native asphalts, the most important solid bitumens are gilsonite, found in large quantities in Utah, and grahamite, a substance similar to gilsonite, but not so pure. Both of these bitumens are hard and black and resemble coal. 
they are not so well adapted as is asphalt for paving purposes, but have many industrial uses. Gilsonite is used largely in coating roofings and making varnishes. It is not unlikely that the reader of this page has some gilsonite about his person, for it is used to stiffen the box of the toe in millions of shoes. Gilsonite was probably formed under very high heat and pressure suddenly applied in the course of some upheaval of nature. Natural asphalt is the product of very slow solidification of petroleum at normal temperatures. Artificial asphalt, or manufactured asphalt, is the result of cooking down petroleum at temperatures as high as 700 degrees for a few hours. We look through and beyond asphalt in the form of a paint for fly screens. We ride upon asphalt whenever we enter a motor car. Whether the street or road be paved with it or not, for asphalt enters into the manufacture of rubber tires. Rubber hot water bottles contain asphalt. Asphalt keeps us dry shod on the streets and serves as a roof when indoors in the form of shingles. Strips of felt are passed through melted asphalt, the surplus squeezed out by steel rollers, and ground slate pressed into the asphalt-saturated felt by hydraulic pressure. The long strips are then cut up into shingles of the most enduring kind. The lasting properties of the asphalt are not changed by transferring it from lake to roof. Large quantities of asphalt are used for waterproofing walls, tunnels, and bridges. It goes into all types of buildings requiring impervious walls and floors or such as require sanitary precaution. Measured by volume, however, its most extensive use is for paving purposes. The Pictures and Story of Asphalt by courtesy of the Barber Asphalt Paving Company, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And this is a picture of a plant for refining asphalt. Practically the only process necessary to make this natural asphalt a perfect commercial product is that of refining. This is done in a plant like the one a portion of which is shown. And that is the end of the section on asphalt. The next section deals with asbestos, which I bet is interesting. A curiosity that became a necessity. And that's when you get into mesothelioma, mesothelioma, but they didn't know about that back then, I'm pretty sure. But asbestos is still used today. It's not gone. They just don't use it like they used to. But we will read that another day. There are so many interesting sections in here that we can read. Things like, why my shadow is longer in winter, why leaves fall what the inside of a mine anchor looks like, bringing the current from the storage battery, what happens when you change gears, how the oil goes through a motor, the inside of a vacuum tank. This book covers so many interesting topics, and we have only read about two. We read about typewriters and asphalt. I don't know how they decided to group these sections together, but we just read these two little sections right here. There's plenty more that we can read, and we will certainly read more in the future. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed getting to listen to a little bit from a book from a hundred years ago. I am so glad that I found this book. I am thoroughly enjoying reading sections of it. Thank you so much for being here. I really hope that you have a wonderful day, and I will see you again really soon.